Okay, so it's been a couple of weeks now and I've let myself take, you know, a good two weeks uh, to really think about Cuba and I've only just started posting about it, so I spent a lot of time thinking about that question actually, what is it like to be an artist there? And it's, it's not going to be a good answer, but um, really what, what it, the first thing I think about really is um, leaving there with more questions than answers. And I sort of expected that, um, but if I'm thinking like visually, it's more like um, thinking of an iceberg where you know, you only see a very little bit and you know there's all of this stuff below the surface but you just can't see it yet, you know. And so in really diverse kind of ways, um, being in Cuba has just revealed many, many more questions with regard to art, looking in the museum, looking at actual artist work, um, looking at the culture, the people, the food, the music obviously. Um, also the terrain, just all of the economic things, all the history, like, you know, it's, um, you know, you always feel that way when you go to a new country, go to a place that is different, you know, different language, all of that. But there's something really different, and I try to be really sensitive to not, you know, <clears throat> over, I don't know, overdoing the mythological parts of Cuba to make it sort of unreal, because it's very real. Um, but um, it's a really, for me personally anyway, from just my own life experiences, it was a really um, kind of dramatic experience of realizing all of my questions. And, and not in a not in an uncomfortable way, you know, in a really positive, you know, everything is really positive there. Everyone's really kind of happy and, you know, obviously I only was there for five days, for six days, but um, there's something really like, I don't know, that feels like a draw there in terms of being an artist. It feels really important there, you know, that would be my best answer. It was really nice to be with this particular group of Arcadia people and other universities because everyone was really supportive of me working and painting and you know everybody spent time in the afternoons usually doing their own little kind of research um, periods of time and um, so you know I, I sort of was always on the lookout for where I wanted to paint or where what sort of called me to, to spend time more somewhere and kind of you know paint uh, interact with it in that way that I do. And, you know, so I did a few paintings of landscape um, by the Malecon, which is at the end of the street where the hotel was. Um, also, we took a day trip to Varadero, and so I'd painted there, and also looking out at the view out my hotel window, which was pretty amazing. And, I mean, really, they're all landscape paintings, so I'm just looking at what's in front of me. And it's different than anything I've seen before you know, especially looking out at the city. Um, but really what, I, what I've reflected on since doing those paintings um, is in those moments when I'm making the paintings, what I'm kind of processing or what I was experiencing as I was painting them. You know, so I'm looking at, at Cuba, looking at Havana. Um, but then when I'm out at the Malecon, there's people who are in my earshot behind me. I was sitting on a monument uh, painting kind of the water and there were three women sitting behind me and, and two of them were sitting kind of leaning against the wall and one was standing and singing and I don't know what they were doing it was some kind of like either a rehearsal or imaginary some kind of exchange I don't know but um, you know they invited me over to to interact with them and you know I said I was busy but um, that happened multiple times when I was painting out out in in Havana, and um, so I'm, I'm not really sure the answer to that question. Um, you know, it's not as though I've, I was sitting painting a person or sitting talking with someone, um, but people come up to me, people interact with me, and I mentioned this before we went, and you know, it's not unusual. Um, so, you know, in that way, painting in Cuba was really just like a a stopping time for me to be able to think about things. <clears throat> and so 
the people really were a lot of what I thought about and and I feel like that's one thing that I you know if I ever went back to Cuba I would really um, look forward especially to a lot of things but especially to that and hopefully learning a little bit more of the language before <laughs> beforehand I met a one artist and then we saw artwork and uh, visited Fuster. Um, so the one artist I met is a young man who um, is Cuban but he shows his work in Miami and he's shown his work in New York and he's done artist residencies in the US. <clears throat> and I had a conversation with him over breakfast and um, he really struck me because on one hand he was explaining how difficult it is for artists to get materials <clears throat> and I knew this kind of already because this artist Rainier um, was the uh, sort of liaison that I spoke with um, to donate art supplies to the local uh, art academy. I don't know if it's local but it's the one of the art academies in, in Cuba and he was an alum of this uh, art academy called San Alejandro which turns out to be the oldest art, art academy in Cuba and maybe the most prestigious um, and so I had known beforehand that art supplies were really difficult for them and you know getting something like a palette knife uh, I was told could take up to five or six months and so so he's saying this over breakfast but then the way he kind of describes it and I guess it's just sort of reality and, and a kind of interesting thing but um, he said all it, all it means really is that we um, I don't know how to describe, maybe not work harder but we um, are, are more intentional or we are intentional about using everything and anything within our power to create <clears throat> and um, so there's, there's no, from what I could gather, and even what I observed in the museum, there's no um, sort of resistance to not having something. And, you know, that's obviously resilience that I think the Cuban people really have, have to have, have been forced to have. Um, but I observed it also, you know, when we went to visit the um, ISA, which is the it's like the biggest art institute in, in Cuba and it's you know students go there for five years it's incredibly competitive to get into um, and those students said those young art students said the same thing um, I actually asked we met with the Dean and I asked the Dean what are the students struggles and he said you'll have to ask the students so we did when we were walking around and um, uh, yeah, it was. The first thing they said was materials, not knowing where they were getting materials, what, what they could use. Um, another thing was, which I was not surprised, but it was nice to hear. Another thing was they um, have the same, you know, they have this unknowable uh, kind of, it's not stress, but it's this presence of not knowing what they're going to do after, after school, which, you know, our students have also. <laughs> Um, but when I was in the studios, back to the materials, when I was in the studios, um, the work that I saw by the students and then later I was at the museum, um, the contemporary work and also the, you know, work from 20, 30 years ago, um, in my own opinion, my humble opinion, um, I felt like it was some of the best works of art I've ever seen, best in terms of um, authenticity, best in terms of um, being its best version of itself um, and just having something about it that um, is self-aware and um, I don't know um, serious but also very very down-to-earth and human and um, and I know those, those are kind of vague adjectives to describe this huge body of art that I've s experienced but um, as I'm, as I'm sort of processing the works of art and all of that, um, what I kind of deduce from it is that, that um, you know, artists there go through um, 
four years at the academy and then five more years at the art institute that we visited. And um, so there's a real kind of patience and commitment to um, allowing progress or something to take its course. And, you know, I'm not judging the way we do things, but just to be curious about that system um, means, I think, that they really value a natural progression of authenticity. Artists are, I think, the only or one of the only groups of, uh, groups of people in Cuba who are granted multiple exit visas um, at a time. And at one time, and um, <clears throat> you know, you could you could conclude a lot from that, and there are a lot of ways of looking at that, um, different from different perspectives. Um, but what I took from it is that the artists are really valued. Um, the artists have an important role, and the government and the culture itself really support artists, um, and. So I think what comes with that is a real uh, confidence in the artists to um, do what really is true for them and not try to please anyone. Um, because that's what happens, right? If, if, if a child is supported, then they find themselves. If a child is stressed, um, they you know, deal, you know, deal with things by coping. And you know, I'm not comparing them to children, but you get the idea. Like <clears throat> if if people are, are supported and seen and felt like, you know, um, valued, then there's a real gift, I think, that is, is, is kind of achieved or there's a real, um, I don't know, unique uh, result that comes out of that. I spent time at the National Art Museum um, and the one that I went in was just Cuban art. And um, yeah, I mean, I've been to a lot of museums. I, you know, I'm not as traveled as a lot of people, but um, it. I wrote this on my blog that it. Um, it's probably one of my top three favorite museums in the world that I've seen, and, you know, was I expecting that? No, but I didn't know what to expect, um, and, the reason, um, is kind of related to what I was just talking about, which is, there was a really diverse representation of work, you know, <clears throat> from all the way back to the 20s and 30s till the 90s even. And um, it was really diverse in terms of uh, methodology, materiality, solutions, ideas. Um, but like I said before, I've never been to a museum that was so diverse and yet Every single thing that I interacted with, and you know, everything didn't speak to me, but everything that I interacted with was just like brimming with authenticity. And I, I'm not judging, like you know, or, or concluding that I know know all of, all about the work, or you know, I'm not an art historian. But there was something in my interaction with it that. Um, I could sense the elements of, of like risk or, or them feeling like, you know, unsure about how something might be received. But everything was its, its like, in my opinion, its best version of itself. Like, if I were to sort of critique an individual piece, all of the things that I would kind of think to from my kind of, um, you know, analytical, uh, uh, observational, contextual art historical perspectives, um, everything, every layer is compelling. And, and I'm not saying they all were, but it was like, it was, it was really, I, I was, you can tell I'm kind of speechless. Like, um, you could spend a month going through that museum and, and it's, what's interesting is to see like connections to European work and Matisse and Cezanne at that time period, um, but then also to see, and I spoke about this before we went to Cuba, but to see the work um, and to think about it through the lens of what was happening in Cuba at the time when the people were making these works of art. And um, I was just blown away. The things that 
I learned from Cuban scholars there had to do with the history of U.S. and Cuban uh, relations, had to do with sort of the history of the revolution, um, both from Raul and also from the Revolution Museum. Um, we went to a lecture on women's issues, women's gender, women gender, sexuality issues in, in Cuban history. <clears throat> also, all of the scholars on the trip shared their own experiences, their own knowledge um, of, uh, you know, Cubans in the U.S. and, and media and culture and history. Um, so all of those things kind of are very intertwined. And, and art is kind of beautiful, I always think, because it can wrap all those things up, you know, in one. And um, So, for example, like going to the Revolution Museum and seeing um, how the Cuban government, the Cuban culture portrays their revolution um, really helped me to look at the work that was made at that time period um, through that lens. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's really an iceberg to begin to even understand it. Um, but having, having the ability to be with people from different disciplines and to attend lectures and museums from all different disciplines really allowed for a kind of a holistic, um, I don't know, let's say beginning to learn. Because um, I, I really just feel like it's a beginning of learning. Um, but to then look at the works of art through that lens. And so I looked, I looked at and talked with Rainier about his work. Um, we went to the uh, house and studio of Fuster, who's one of the most famous, I think, Cuban artists. Um, and instead of bringing an American perspective and, and sort of having that kind of interaction, um, having this basis of knowledge from all these different areas, really made the experience kind of like uh, much more kind of calm and um, smooth or uh, nuanced and in a way that was really, really helpful. And <clears throat> so I feel like, you know, for students or for artists, art students, any student really, being in Cuba, um, it's so important to have that holistic view because um, it's such a different place, you know, they have a, they have a real uh, interest in the U.S., but it's very different than the U.S., and their, their goals are very different than anything I've heard about before. And so to look at the works of art, which I think oftentimes show, like, the pulse of a of, of place, you know, um, to look at the works of art with that holistic picture was really helpful. And... Um, in terms of what artists decided to do in their work, but also what the artists decided not to do in their work, and like those kind of important decisions that you can pick up on when you're really, really kind of studying, uh, you know, a whole museum or someone's whole body of artwork, you know, um, and um, so I guess you know I, I had hoped for that before we went to Cuba and. And I think maybe that's just kind of true in any place that you go. You really need to understand the place in order to, to really um, have a lens through which to look at the works of art. Um, but the other, the, the opposite was also true. Like I, I, I made a point in the museum of really, in the art museum, of, of trying to look at the works of art um, in a way that would inform what I had heard from the scholars about the history or from the scholar, scholar about uh, women's history. And um, to sort of have that back and forth, I think, um, you know, be, being able to be there, not just looking at slides or looking at the images in a book or reading or just seeing a video or something, being able to actually see the works of art, feel the presence, um, and to have that back and forth where on one day we're at the Revolution Museum, on the next day we're at the Art Museum, on the next day we're listening to a lecture on women's studies. and. You know, all of that was like, you know, totally amazing. I would, I would group visual and audio together <laughs> in terms of Havana. Um, particularly, and the reason I say that is because I was particularly, particularly affected by, um, 
any time that I was in a taxi. And um, the really sensory experience that comes with being in Cuban taxis, um, the sounds, the visual, um, all of that. And so I, I felt like riding through Havana, and um, I did some walking, but I, I, did, I did try to ride taxis because I enjoyed it so much. Um, but riding through Havana really, I think, was one of my favorite parts of the trip, in a way, I guess, because not only were you kind of taken back in time often, these cars are, you know, 30, I was in one that was 35, 40 years old, um, which, you know, doesn't happen often with me. <laughs> um, but to, to have that experience and, and to see, like, it's working, you know, it works for them. Maybe they wouldn't choose it, I don't know. Maybe they would choose it over a newer car. But to have that, being in that kind of place, um, sometimes you couldn't see through, through the windshield because it was so cracked and broken, but it worked. But then to have that juxtaposed with seeing like this amazing, um, these amazing facades and the people and all of that, um, it was, I mean, it was kind of at first glance degraded or degrading. Um, but on the other hand, and I'm, and I'm not discounting the degraded parts of it, but on the other hand, um, it, was o it was okay. I mean, the buildings still functioned even though the facades were falling apart. And, and I want to make sure to, to, you know, yeah, at least bring up that I didn't go inside many places that were falling, look, that appeared to be falling down. And I know some people on the trip did. I hope they will share their experience there. Um, so I know that it's, it's not like an easy way to live at all. Um, but as an artist, seeing it visually, you know, I, I try not to see it in terms of, you know, um, kind of the imperialistic view of, isn't it so quaint or something like that. Um, but I don't know, it was, it was nice to be in a place where there wasn't a lot of advertising. I mean, there was no advertising visually. So everything you looked at, you know, it, remind, it reminded me a little bit of Italy in that way where everything you look at is about the color and the texture and the pattern. And there were often uh, works of art around murals. There were a lot of sculptures, metal, and other kinds of sculptures that were around. And um, so I guess if I were to boil it down, really it, w it would be the, that idea of not being inundated with um, sort of media and cultural driven images, but being able to really have a barrage almost of color and pattern and uh, structural differences and it's you know it's incredibly diverse the same thing um, <clears throat> it's it's not as though there is some overarching aesthetic really you know it's it's an iceberg <laughs> again um, but I was I was really uh, energized by the lack of um, advertising. That was big for me. I can speak to Verdadero because I did walk around there quite a bit. I actually walked in the, in the opposite direction of the, the main part of the town, so I was like really, I don't know where I was. Um, but I got a sense that artists um, have really high standards there, which I think is really inspiring because given that they might not have a lot at their disposal. And I think I started to feel that way when I was at the ISA Institute of Art, um, realizing that they take five years. So it's a total of nine years of art study. Um, that's, that's a real commitment by, uh, on the part of everyone to creating artists who have the time to develop their own ideas. And <clears throat> So, the, so it's really serious there. It's, it's not, um, 
it's not a, at all about producing a lot of artists. Like, it's about finding the artists, which I think speaks to what Luis talked about, the professor at the Hemispheric Studies Center, uh, talked about in terms of really being patient and observing what's going on. And the students refer to that, that we met with, that we ran into. They were saying how, how valuable it was that they had five years that they could really work out their ideas and think about who they were as artists. And, and so the reason I say that with regard to Varadero is there were artists, but whenever I saw an artist or spoke with an artist, I always felt like they put themselves first. And the only thing I can compare it to quickly is like being in Italy where, and I'm, I'm not generalizing all artists in Italy, but there are a lot of places in Italy where artists will be on the street really about, you know, making a point of really putting themselves out there. And in Cuba, it was very different. I felt like they were much more internally focused. And in a way, I think that's the way it should, you know, the way it might, should be, maybe should be, or um, is a good way to be. Um, but if I try to be, step back from it, um, I could see that I don't know, it, it creates other challenges, let's say. And I asked um, Raul in his lecture about Cuban history, what, what kind of a role artists play. And that's when I learned about artists being able to have multiple exit visas um, and being really supported by the government and in terms of travel and freedoms. Um, and, and so I started thinking about it, and then when we met with the dean of the ISA, I asked um, specifically about that. Um, do they, in their five years, which is a pretty significant chunk of time, in addition to the four, do they um, teach what could be called entrepreneurship or you know, marketing um, basics of business, those kind of things? Um, because you would think if artists are supported uh, with regard to freedom, they would really be able to thrive in, in the way that the tourist industry really thrives in Cuba. Um, and I didn't know what his answer would be at all. Um, and from what I gather, we had, a, we had someone translating, Pam was translating. From what I gathered, um, they don't have anything like that. And, and yet, um, they have a real interest in that. Um, and he, in fact, I, I believe what he said was that they're developing or they're starting to or they're, they're in the early stages of developing some kind of a additional curriculum that addresses that idea of entrepreneurship in art. And, you know, I even asked um, the gender, women's and gender studies scholar about that and she sort of said, yes, we, we could use that or something like that. Um, but it's not really present yet. And um, so I kind of framed it in a way where I talked about the class that I developed here that, that does address the beginnings of thinking about how an artist might make a, a career in, in, a, in a way that might be a little different than the traditional gallery artist relationship in the context of how the art world is really changing a lot. Um, but I, I would imagine that um, there's a real interest. The dean expressed it, and I, if I base it off of what the student's answer was, that um, you know, to some degree, not entirely, but to some degree, feeling like you've learned strategies or even the basics of the ideas of entrepreneurship with regard to art, that can reduce a lot of stress as you're getting t toward the end of your art, art schooling. Um, because even if it doesn't change anything, it just kind of reduces some stress because you feel like you know at least what you need to know. Even if you don't master all of it, you still need to know, you, you still have an awareness of what is knowable. You know, everything is sort of able to be figured out at that point if you know what's, what's out there. Um, so, you know, I did ask that question kind of with my own interest in mind, and um, I was, I was kind of excited about their answer because 
it's not clear cut like it is that they have an interest, but I, I can see that they also um, um, have an awareness of sort of the tension between um, addressing things like entrepreneurship, marketing, promotion, uh, basics of business, and the, the tension that that creates with having the ability and the time to really um, develop as our artists, which is really kind of a separate, a separate uh, endeavor. So the first painting I did in Cuba um, on Monday when we were there was at the Melicon, which is um, uh, I think a four, about a four mile stretch of seawall that was built um, man-made. Um, and uh, it's sort of like a, a, a promenade, I guess I would describe it. There's kind of a, a nice wide walkway, a, a kind of a wide wall, maybe three or four feet even wide, wide enough that people walk along or stand on it, sit on it. Um, and it, it's really sort of like a, a main street almost, which is kind of ironic because the stuff along the Malecon is not what you would think of as taking advantage of a, you know, an ocean view. Um, but it really is a draw, like, I think, what, from what I gather, like, people go to the Malecon. It's like a thing to do. It's, it's a really positive experience. And I was particularly drawn to it because um, of the visual, this really long wall, but also when you kind of peer over the wall, which you have to be careful, um, it, it, it has a pretty significant kind of uh, impact with the sea. And so there are often like huge waves, like what looked to me like 20, 30 feet splashes. And, you know, uh, I would imagine it's, it can get even more. I mean, we weren't there when there was any kind of weather coming through. <clears throat> um, so there's fishing and people sort of further down by where the fort, the, the lighthouse and fort were at the inlet area by Old Havana. People got actually down on the rocks and um, it's like a place to hang out and, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a cultural attraction there. And so that's kind of why I was drawn to it. I had, I had never painted um, sort of this expansive seawall before, so that was, that was kind of curious to me. Um, and really the, the, uh, the biggest decision I made was where to stand because you, you can't really guarantee that you're not gonna get like a, a tidal wave of, <laughs> of water. And I saw a lot of people walking along as I was painting who didn't, pay attention really to that, or I don't know if they were tourists or something, but totally got, you know, a huge deluge of, of water on them. Um, so anyway, while I was doing that, you know, there were fishermen who talked to me, there were people walking by who talked to me. Um, you know, we didn't actually talk because I don't speak Spanish very much, um, but there was still that interaction and so, um, it makes the painting experience different than it would have been otherwise. Um, and then I painted the Malecon again. Uh, well, let's say the second painting I did was um, actually later that night, um, I got back to the, the room, the hotel, and um, spent a lot of time kind of looking at the view out the window. And um, I wrote about this on my blog that because it was our first day, I didn't know what that view usually looks like. And over the course of the week, I saw it foggy and hazy and rainy and clear. And, but this particular night, it was pretty late at night, like 11, 30, 12 at night. Um, the sky passed all of sort of the skyline of Havana, if you can call it that, was red and purple and really interesting color. And so, you know, I was tired from traveling, but I was like, you know, I don't know if this is going to happen again. So I painted it, and um, I'm really glad I did because not only was it really interesting to paint a city where there wasn't a lot of light, there was very few lights on actually, um, but it didn't happen again. <laughs> so I was glad that I painted that nocturne kind of uh, nightscape. Um, and then the Malecon was 
in my mind, so I painted it again actually. I had, had it in my mind that I wanted to paint it again um, later in the day when I knew that the sun was going to be kind of going down and there would be sort of like more of a shimmer sparkle on the water. Um, I didn't really paint that the first time because it was foggy. Um, so I did that and um, that was when the women were behind me singing and chattering and talking to me and that was again you know a, a memory that experience I wouldn't have had and um, actually some of the people in the gr group told me after the fact that they rode by I don't know if you were in that group but they rode by in a taxi I didn't see them or know where they were but they observed me sort of sitting in the midst of the Malikon you know without me knowing and um, it was kind of it was kind of fun. I don't usually have that experience. Usually I go off by myself and paint and no one sees it. But it was kind of nice to, see, to hear other people's observations of me painting there, you know. And um, then I brought my paints when we went to Varadero, which is the, I guess you could call it a resort town, beach town, in um, about maybe two hours uh, east of, of Havana. And I mean, it was, I, I've never really been to a Caribbean place, and so it was like sandy beach, you know, white sandy beach, like soft sand, the water was warm, it was like this turquoise, like, and what made it even more interesting as a painter was um, that I could sit right on the sand on the beach and paint, but that we had this really interesting storm go through. And so as I'm painting, you know, there's this, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, oh, this will be great. It'll be a nice, nice teal water with this nice blue sky. And then as I'm painting, like this huge storm comes through across. And I'm like, okay, let me change the sky. <laughs> so I did. And um, I took a, a couple of pictures to show like five minutes apart. It looked like an entirely different place, which, you know, that's always a fun part of, of plein air landscape painting is that the light can completely change and you're, you, you either go with it or you stop, you know. Um, so that was kind of fun with that one and um, a couple of people came up to me along the beach. I actually met someone who I think was the director of the uh, art university in um, Cyprus and so there's always encounters like that that you would never have otherwise. And the owner of the, of the place that was behind us also came over and, and talked to me and he was really excited. And so I like that. I like to um, interact with people in that way, as limited as it is. Um, and so then my last painting, which I haven't posted on my blog yet, um, I'm, I'm keeping all the Cuba paintings, by the way, too, which I don't normally do. It just feels important to keep them for now. But the last painting, um, the fifth one I did, was one actually that I had started painting in my mind when we got there, when I first looked out the window of my hotel room. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but all week I had sort of been mentally preparing myself to try to paint the view out the window of the city, which I'd never painted anything like that before. Um, you know, I paint landscapes a lot, but never like a cityscape like that. And um, so it finally Friday, it wasn't something I was conscious of, but finally Friday afternoon, I just, without even thinking, just sat down and started painting it. And, um, you know, it was definitely what I expected in some ways, but also not what I expected in other ways. But sometimes I have that experience where I'll see something or I'll, I'll buy a piece of fruit that maybe I haven't painted before and I'll, I'll leave it sort of sitting in, in my kitchen or sitting on the kitchen table and I'll just let myself walk by it all week before I am ready to paint it. So it's sort of like mentally preparing. And so I think that's what happened with the view out my window. Um, and <clears throat> I showed it to um, Anna, Anna Maria and also Pam. And um, it was really nice for me because you know, I'd never done anything like that before. I was a little self-conscious about it. And they both looked at it and said, it's Havana. And so that was really nice for me. <laughs>